policy, including establishing guidelines for the use of U.S. coasts, oceans, and the Great Lakes. This Natural Resources Subcommittee on Oceans hearing is about three and a half hours. The legislative hearing by the Subcommittee on Fisheries, Wildlife and Oceans will come to order. The Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on H.R. 21, the Oceans Conservation, Education and National Strategy for the 21st Century Act. Pursuant to Committee Rule 4G, the Chairman and the Ranking Minority Member will make opening statements. If any other members have statements, I invite you to submit them for the record. This morning's hearing will focus on H.R. 21, the Oceans Conservation, Education and National Strategy for the 21st Century Act. This forward-looking legislation seeks to establish a comprehensive national ocean policy in the United States, improve federal agency coordination with respect to our ocean resources, encourage and support regional ocean governance, codify the functions of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in law, and establish an open trust fund to support improved conservation and management of our oceans. During a hearing that we held in March, this subcommittee heard about priorities for ocean policy reform in the United States from former Congressman, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and White House Chief of Staff Leon Panetta, and former Secretary of Energy Admiral James Watkins, the chairs of the Pew Oceans Commission and the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, respectively, determined to ensure that the recommendations of their two commissions do not simply collect dust on a shelf. They have joined forces to establish the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative, and together they offered significant evidence and justification for action on the part of Congress to reform and improve the management and the conservation of our oceans. The United States is the custodian over, of over 13,000 miles of coastline and 3.4 million square nautical miles of ocean. 60,000 square nautical miles of ocean surround my home district of Guam alone. And according to the National Ocean Economics Program, our ocean economy generated $138 billion and 2.3 million jobs in 2004. While providing these many benefits, our oceans also face many threats in the form of pollution, overfishing, coastal development, oil and gas development, and climate change. Addressing these threats is complicated by the fact that we manage our oceans under a patchwork of uncoordinated laws and policies implemented by numerous federal and state agencies. So it is time for us to formally recognize the importance of the ocean to this nation's economic, environmental, and social well-being by implementing legislation to reform the shortcomings of our current management system. It is our duty as representatives of the American people to ensure that the ocean and its resources will be managed in a way that allows for their continued use and enjoyment for all the generations to come. H.R. 21 is an important step forward in that effort, and I do look forward to hearing from its sponsors and our other witnesses here today. The chairwoman now recognizes Mr. Brown, the ranking Republican member, for any statement that he may have. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, we are here today to discuss H.R. 21, the Ocean Conservation Education National Strategy for the 21st Century Act, which was sponsored by our colleague, Congressman Sam Farr from California. While better coordination is certainly needed with regard to the management of our ocean and the visual vital resources, H.R. 21 mandates far too many regulatory requirements in one piece of legislation. One area of concern is the creation of a national ocean policy and standards. The national policy and standards would apply to any federal action authorized, including the issuance of federal licenses and permits carried out or funded by a federal agency affecting U.S. waters. Even if there are existing legislature authorizing the federal, federal agency action, H.R. 21 will require the federal agency to certify that action in question would be conducted in a manner that is consistent with the protection, maintenance, and restoration of healthy ecosystems. In addition, the bill requires the administration of the National Ocean 
Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to make a determination on the action, including a detailed assessment of the effects the action will have on the marine environment and recommendation to remedy any identical deficiencies. We currently have a law governing environmental impacts of Federal actions on the environment, the National Environmental Policy Act. I find it unnecessary to create an over, overreaching new law which would duplicate existing statutes. I support better coordination to ensure the conservation and best management practices of our coastal areas, the ocean and its resources, but we should be able to do so without creating a newly overly burdensome process. Another area of concern with H.R. 21 deals with the creation of an Ocean and Great Lakes Conservation Trust Fund. While I find the creation of a special stamp an interesting way to allow the public to show its support for ocean conservation activities based on the outcome of previous semi-postal pools, it still it will not generate enough revenue to support even some of the myriads of activities prescribed in H.R. 21. The author of the bill must also recognize this limitation, since the bill would direct the Tre Secretary of Treasury to deposit $1.3 billion in general revenue every year after fiscal year 2007 into the trust fund. General revenue in the Treasury allocated to existing programs. As we all know, the House re reinstated the pay-as-you-go rule of this Congress, which will require a budget offset for the use of those, these general revenues. Existing programs would have to be reduced or the American taxpayers would be hit with the staggering new tax bills to raise the money to be transferred into the Ocean Trust Fund. Madam Chairman, I do not agree with the approach taken in H.R. 21, which is objectively overprescriptive. Instead, I would recommend looking at each chapter of the Ocean Commission report and a specific piece of legislature references to develop specific changes to each law instead of creating a new overreaching bill that supersedes existing authorities. Congress initiated a review of our ocean policies when we passed the Ocean Act of 2000. The U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy released its report in September 2004, and the Congress started its deliberation on its recommendation in the 109th Congress. I would be pleased to work with you, Madam Chairman, as we develop ocean legislation that will benefit your constituents in Guam and mine in South Carolina and the nation. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and deliberating further on what action Congress should take with regards to the Ocean Commission recommendation. And I thank you, Madam Chairman, for, for conducting this hearing today. And, and I really look forward to listening to the witnesses. Thank you very much. The Chair thanks Mr. Brown, the gentleman from South Carolina. And now I would like to recognize Mr. Saxon, an original co-sponsor of this legislation, for a brief opening statement. Mr. Saxon. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. First, let me uh, welcome uh, our great friends and colleagues, uh, Mr. Farr and Mr. Allen, uh, this morning as our uh, First witnesses, and I must say, as you just said, Madam Chair Lady, I'm very proud to have been able to join with uh, these two gentlemen and a few others in, in co sponsoring this legislation. And thank you, Madam Chair Lady, for holding this hearing today. I think it's a, a great start. Um, various versions of the Oceans 21 bill have been introduced in each Congress since uh, uh, the 108th Congress. As a co chair of the Oceans, uh, the House Oceans Caucus, and as someone with a great interest in the health of our coastal and ocean areas, I've been pleased to work with uh, the other co-chairs of the caucus in drafting <laughs> and refining the legislation that is the subject of our hearing today. We do need to make progress on the big picture, Madam Chair Lady. Re reforms highlighted by the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, establishing a, no a, a national ocean policy for federal coordinated framework, passing a NOAA Organic Act, and supporting regional governance initiatives are extremely important. This bill, uh, I must say, uh, like every other bill that, is, uh, that comes before this, uh, this uh, committee, may not be perfect. But that's why the committee is here, to work the imperfections and to make them as good as we can. I remain concerned about the effect of a number of provisions contained in the bill, but let's work on it. I do believe that the Oceans 21 represents a very good starting point for discussions and will help us make progress implementing much needed reforms. Let me just, let me just make one, uh, one other comment, uh, Madam Chair Lady. I'm working on another related project and maybe it can become part of this project. Um, the gentleman to my right represents uh, much of the beautiful eastern shore of Maryland, uh, which borders on the Chesapeake Bay. And I prefer to look at the ocean, its tributaries, and, it, and the estuarian areas as one system. 
And uh, to the extent that we can deal with issues like those that confront my colleague from Maryland and the Chesapeake Bay, uh, recognizing that the issues involved in this uh, in these subjects are extremely important, uh, we, we can make uh, real progress. So uh, I look forward to uh, working with you, Madam Chair Lady, the uh, other co-sponsors uh, of, of the bill, and with uh, interested parties to uh, bring this bill to the floor. I think it's high time we did so, and I hope that we can do it in a coordinated, amicable way. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, uh, Mr. Saxon. I would uh, now like to recognize our witnesses, and our first panel includes members uh, who have asked to testify on the legislation and includes the lead sponsors of the bill. But before I do that, I would like to welcome uh, the gentlelady from uh, California, Mrs. Capps, and also Mr. Uh, Wayne Gilchrist from the state of Maryland. And before I do that, I have one special guest in the audience. Um, I would like to take just a moment to recognize Sidoni Becton. Sidoni is a senior of Georgetown Visitation High School. She is shadowing me today as part of a program sponsored by the Women's Caucus, the Women's Policy Incorporated, Girls Incorporated, and the National Capital Council of the Girl Scouts of the United States of America. Would you please stand, Ms. Becton? Uh, madam, madam, may I do the same? Huh? I apologize to request going out of order, but I also have a daughter here today, and her name is Mickey, and she is a part of the Take Your Daughters to Work, and I want to th thank our chairwoman for uh, acknowledging this wonderful program and the sponsoring organizations and the fact that we have two budding leaders in our um, audience should make our witnesses do even a better job of testifying today. <laughs> it just further proves women's power. <laughs> now it is my uh, great distinction to be able to introduce the Honorable Sam Farr, Congressman from the 17th District of California and the Honorable Tom Allen from the 1st District of the lovely state of Maine. Uh, the chairwoman now recognizes Congressman Farr to testify for five minutes. I am uh, delighted to be here with you and the committee and ranking member Mr. Brown as a representative of a team effort. There's two of us sitting at this table and there's two members of the, this team sitting on the dais uh, who are all the co-sponsors of this bill. This bill that you're reviewing today started here in this committee in year 2000 with the creation of an Oceans Commission. For the same reasons that Mr. Brown talked about is that there's sort of chaos in the sea. And what we were learning in Congress is that the oceans are dying and have been dying for, for years because we dump everything that we don't want on land into the oceans. And that's having a consequential effect. When you try to solve the problems, they become very complex because the United States government has created a multiplicity of agencies and jurisdictions, more so than in any other area. And when you think about it on land and in the air, we've created a governance system with the air traffic control so that we can at least have some coordination of what's going up into the air. And on land, we've created a national transportation program that integrates national, state, and local policy in road building. When it comes to the seas, it's just a chaos between the responsibilities of the federal government, the responsibilities of state government, and local government, and, in and many times conflicts that hurt the economic well-being uh, of, of those users of the sea. So how do you uh, put all this together? This committee along with the Senate, created a, a commission, which you mentioned that Admiral Watkins, not only a former head of naval operations, but um, Secretary of Energy, was the chair of. That, that bill was signed into law by President Clinton. The members of that commission were appointed by President Bush. That commission worked alongside of a private commission called the Pew Charitable Trust that had um, uh, the, co the original chair was Christy Todd Whitman, former governor. Uh, she had to resign when she became uh, head of EPA. 
Uh, Leon Panetta, former Chief of Staff, took over and chaired it. And you've had the co-chairs of both of those commissions present their collective report. This bill is that product. And for all of us who are lawmakers, I have to say that I don't think in my lifetime I've ever seen a piece of legislation that has had more national scrutiny because these commissions held hearings all over the United States in, from all aspects and put together their collective interests in what they thought would address the concerns of having a national ocean policy. So we're very fortunate that a lot of that work that usually has to be done here uh, and, and has been done. And we were able to glean, and we did this by using uh, a, a bipartisan process created in an Oceans Caucus, and all the participants in that caucus and their staffs gleaned through these reports, pulled out what they thought would be uh, appropriate legislation. Now, we have what is not in this bill is the issues relating to fisheries. That's in the Magnuson Act, and our Congress updated uh, the reenactment of the Magnuson Act last year. What's not in this bill is marine mammal protection. But what is in this bill is an, is an ability to create at the regional level, at the local level, not top down, but a bottoms up that meets a national policy standard. That is very, very exciting because it brings certainty, which is what we don't have now, it brings certainty to uh, the governance of the sea. And this country has the responsibility for all the waters around it and the Great Lakes, the waters of the sea, as you know, in Guam, out to 200 miles. And in the only way we're ever going to be able to um, create a national policy on that is to adopt legislation such as this. I commend you. This bill has been introduced by Jim Greenwood many years ago. We worked on that. Never got a hearing. Later by Kurt Weldon. Never got a hearing because it wasn't the priority uh, of this committee in the past. It is the priority of the nation right now, and I congratulate you for allowing us to have this hearing, and I congratulate all my co-partners that are in this room today for the hard work that they've done in bringing this legislation to you. And with that, the other co-sponsor of this bill, uh, Tom Allen who, from Maine, who, who represents a fishing, uh, a fishing state. The Chair thanks. Uh the Honorable Mr. Farr for his testimony, and your entire statement will be entered into the record. I now recognize our colleague from Maine, Mr. Tom Allen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank you and uh, Ranking Member Brown for holding this hearing. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with my friend Sam Farr, who, uh, along with Mr. Saxton and Mr. Gilchrist, have been working on this legislation for some period of time. And now we, we have a product, and as uh, uh, I think Mr. Uh, Saxton said it, it may not be perfect, but it can be made better by this committee. Madam Chair, my home state of Maine is a coastal state, and our way of life is profoundly connected to the ocean. Many of my constituents depend directly on the ocean for their livelihoods through ocean-related industries such as commercial and recreational fishing, aquaculture, tourism, transportation, and other industries. However, all Americans from Maine to Oklahoma to Alaska, not forgetting Guam, Madam Chair, are connected to the oceans in many additional ways. We depend on the oceans for food, transportation, and protection. The oceans are closely connected to weather, and the effects of oceanographic fluctuations are felt from the farmlands in our interior to the coastal plains. We need to understand oceanographic patterns in order to understand, predict, and protect ourselves from weather patterns, ocean-related natural disasters, and climate change. The U.S. Econ ocean economy is valued at over $115 billion per year and supports over 28 million jobs. Oceans are culturally important to Americans in ways that simply cannot be easily quantified. There is a critical need to effectively coordinate use of the oceans by all the diverse interest groups that depend on them, from fishermen to oil and gas companies to those in the tourism industry. At the same time, it is critical that we keep our oceans healthy and protect the marine ecosystems upon which we all depend. This bill, H.R. 21, is an important first step. It will do several things, but I want to mention four. 
One, it will establish a national ocean policy and standards for management of U.S. oceans and coasts. It is critical that we have a comprehensive management plan for this valuable resource. Two, it will promote ecosystem-based regional ocean governance. Every region has specific economic and ecological needs, and management must be responsive to those needs. This regional structure will be collaborative and facilitate communication among federal, state, and local management agencies. Three, it will enhance national oceans governance structure by strengthening important existing functions and facilitating communication at the national level. This includes codification of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Four, it will establish an Oceans and Great Lakes Conservation Trust Fund. This fiscally responsible step will help to fund local, state, and federal efforts to develop and implement this act. I believe that this bill will be good for my home state of Maine and obviously for, for all other states. But for Maine, just to give an example, it will first sanction, lend credibility, and provide structure and consistent funding for the Gulf of Maine Council. Second, it will help us to accomplish state goals that require a regional response. And third, it will make the federal government more responsive to and focused on regional needs. The bottom line is that cooperation and coordination are essential in order for us to protect our ocean resources and also for us to profit from them. Our own economic well-being and the health of our oceans depend on our ability to successfully share these resources. H.R. 21 is the first step toward securing for present and future generations the full range of benefits of healthy marine ecosystems. And uh, I just want to congratulate all those who have been involved in this bill. We look forward to hearing the, the results of, uh, of this hearing. Uh, I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank my uh, two colleagues for their testimony and uh, to give them an A+. Plus. They stayed within the five-minute limit. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to ask you, invite you to, to be here on the dais uh, for the remainder of the hearing and ask unanimous consent from my colleagues that they be allowed to do so. Hearing no objection, so ordered. The Chairwoman now recognizes our second panel of witnesses, and before that I'd like to recognize the representative from my sister territory, American Samoa, the Honorable Eni Paloma Vega, who's joined us. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, certainly want to thank you for your initiative and certainly with our ranking member, the gentleman from South Carolina, for uh, having this hearing this morning. Uh, I think the last hundred years that I've been a member of this committee uh, I don't know how much more I need to say about the value of oceans, as I've always complained that over the years, uh, our national interest involving oceans or marine resources, the, uh, the tremendous potential, as it is demonstrated already in terms of a, uh, how much uh, our economy depends so much on the oceans and the coastal states that uh, provide for that uh, need, whether it be for commercial purposes, whether it be for conservation. Uh, as you know, we both uh, live in the largest ocean in the world. Uh, you're in the Northern Pacific, I'm in the South Pacific. Uh, my little jurisdiction is about 2,400 miles directly south of Hawaii. And uh, I seem to notice that there's a lot of question marks and some of the people there in the audience are where in the world is this guy from? Um, but as I've said, uh, Madam Chair, the uh, I've always said if it was possible for the Congress, and uh, if you want to know the priorities of our country, look at the budget. And I have the utmost respect to the fact that each year we allocate about a billion dollars for the needs of our land-grant colleges and institutions because in those days, as, as it is true, the value of agriculture, uh, the mainstay and the, and the heart and soul of, of, of one of our economic bases. And my question is why can't we provide the same kind of resources to develop and conserve what we have out there in the oceans. And uh, I think this is as a direct interest not only for all our coastal states, but those of us who live right in the middle of the ocean. Now, we've said that, uh, uh, that coral reef is the, is the farm, or I say the ocean is our farm. And so I, I uh, want to thank the good, uh, my good friend from California and uh, uh, the gentleman from Maine for, for their sponsorship of this legislation. My only disappointment, Madam Chair, is that my name is not on it as an original co-sponsor of this legislation. 
as I totally agree with my good friend, Mr. Saxton, it is a good start. Uh, the only concern that I may have is that if we might be overlapping or duplicating some other aspects of other councils and other organizations that still deal also with marine resources, conservation of our oceans. And this is something that I think our subcommittee has to look at very carefully. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Falama Vega. And uh, the Chair also welcomes another member to the committee, and that's Mr. Frank Pallone. And now, um, our witnesses on this second panel include Mr. Jack Dunnigan, Assistant Administrator for Ocean Services and Coastal Zone Management at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and Ms. Kathleen Layden, Chair of the Regional Ocean Governance Work Group for the Coastal State Organization and Director of the Maine Coastal Program. I would like now to recognize Mr. Dunnigan to testify for five minutes, and I would note for all witnesses that the red timing light on the table will indicate when your time has concluded, and we would appreciate your cooperation in complying with the limits that have been set, as we have many witnesses to hear from today. So be assured that your full written statement will be submitted for the hearing record. And now, Mr. Dunnigan. Um, I'm Jack Dunnigan from NOAA. I am uh, in that, that great title that the chair lady uh, recognized. That makes me the director of the National Ocean Service. And uh, I have a great opportunity to work with um, many wonderful people who are passionately concerned um, about the oceans and about protecting the heritage that they represent. Uh, Madam Chair, since you indicate that the statement will be included in the record, I think I'd just like to highlight uh, a couple of uh, important ideas that we think are in the administration's testimony. Um, I think if you read the testimony, you can tell that there are some major concerns that the administration has with many provisions of this legislation. Uh, I think, however, you should not take that to indicate that we don't share um, much of the, of the passion and the goals that the sponsors of this legislation would like uh, to see us move towards. And from our standpoint, we would certainly look forward to continuing to have the opportunity to talk to the committee and talk to your staff about these important issues of uh, the oceans and the environmental and economic security uh, that they imply for our country. So we look forward to continuing to have those discussions. Um, over the past three years, the administration has been working to address many of the priority areas that are contained in H.R. 21 and that have been identified by the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, the P. Oceans Commission, and the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative. Uh, through the President's Ocean Action Plan and the existing Committee on Ocean Policy, the administration has taken significant steps to improve uh, and the effective management of our nation's ocean and coastal resources. The administration has also supported strengthening NOAA and taking better steps to coordinate all of our programs regionally with a broad array of our partners. H.R. 21 seeks to implement many of the U.S. Ocean Commission's recommendations by establishing a national oceans policy and national standards for actions that affect U.S. ocean waters and ocean resources. The concerns that we have with the approach as proposed in the bill as it currently stands um, are that it may actually create some conflicts with a vast array of legislation that uh, Congress has passed and that we already administer. Uh, Congress did a lot of work last year to get the Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorized, and we're, we're working very hard to implement that. Uh, we think that the, the best way to see these statutes get coordinated is for those parts of the agencies that have that responsibility to sit down and work these things out. We're not sure that the way the bill approaches it to establish a lot of structure around that is really the best way for us to go forward. Um, at the same time that the President released his Ocean Action Plan, which identifies many actions which are needed to more effectively manage ocean and coastal resources, NOAA was designated the lead uh, by the Council on Environmental Quality or the co-lead on 45 different items. And we've been working very hard under the Ocean Action Plan to address those items. As of today, 36 of them um, ha are, have been completed and we are still working on nine. So there is very much that's ongoing uh, on the part of the administration in following up on the report of the U.S. Commission 
and on implementing the President's Oceans Action Plan. H.R. 21 would reestablish NOAA stipulating its mission and functions through an organic act. Uh, NOAA has long believed and the administration has long believed that there should be organic legislation for establishing NOAA. Uh, we had legislation that was proposed in the 109th Congress and the administration will shortly be delivering legislation to you for the 110th Congress that will uh, do much the same as we propose. So we'd like to make sure we have the opportunity to discuss those issues when that bill is available from the administration. Uh, this bill would do a lot for regional collaboration. You should know that NOAA has been spending uh, tremendous efforts to help support the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, uh, the Governor's Initiative in the Northeast, uh, the Three Governors Initiative in, uh, along the West Coast, California, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, we think there's a lot of energy that is in the system that is really percolated up from the bottom that is giving us an opportunity uh, to move forward in the same direction that the bill would like to take us. Madam Chair, the last point that I'll make here in moral testimony um, has to do with an integrated ocean observing system, which is referred to in the legislation. Uh, it's long been a priority of NOAA and of the administration. Uh, to integrate our ocean observing systems and have agencies working more collaboratively with each other, with stakeholders, with regional partners, uh, in order to make better use of the data that's available and to fill gaps. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity to work with you and with your staff on legislation that can get that done. Thank, Thank you, uh, Mr. Dunnigan. And now the chair would like to recognize uh, Ms. Layden. Ranking Member Brown and distinguished members of the subcommittee, my name is Kathleen Layden and I'm here today representing the Coastal States Organization. CSO, as Coastal States Organization is known, represents the 35 states and territories in Washington, D.C. relative to issues of ocean policy and legislation that affects the coast. With my written testimony in the record, um, and this being the first time that I'm doing this, I'm going to pray that I meet the five-minute mark and therefore just focus on a few things. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Representative Farr and Representatives Allen, Gilchrist, and Saxton for their leadership in putting forward such a comprehensive approach as is reflected in Oceans 21. My colleague um, from CSO, our current chair, Brian Baird from California, couldn't be here today but he wanted to make sure that I recognized the early efforts of Mr. Farr in California when as a state assemblyman, he was responsible for developing the California Ocean Resources Management Act, which launched comprehensive ocean management in that state. So thank you for your ongoing commitment to the oceans and we're thrilled that a national dialogue has begun on Oceans 21. So what's the problem? I'm not here today to reiterate the things that you've already heard in recent weeks about the crisis in, our, uh, in our, the health of our oceans and coasts. But what I'd like to say, as um, Representative Allen um, said, is that ocean and coastal resources are the lifeblood of coastal states, and degradation of them affects local people in very real ways. At the state level, we're facing increasingly complex coastal challenges, and we can't deal with them on our own, and we need a new way of working together to accomplish results. If I had to choose three, fra three phrases to describe our current ocean management regime, I would choose fragmented, reactive, and largely lacking an opportunity for real cooperative management between federal, state, and local entities in um, effectively managing resources. So what's the solution? Um, if the states were to design a solution ourselves, I think that, um, I know that we agree that the components as reflected in Oceans 21 are the key things. That is, a structure for regional ocean governance, a statement of national ocean policy, improved coordination of federal action, a coordinated management regime for federal waters, and a much needed ocean and coastal trust fund. These types of things really lay the groundwork for us to begin to actually do um, ecosystem-based management, which we talk about a lot, um, but need to really um, advance our efforts in. Our concerns about Oceans 21 track two general themes that we think are solvable through additional conversations, and those are the need for flexibility and the need um, to build on work that's already being done. CSO remains committed to working with the bill's sponsors and other interested parties over the coming months to resolve the differences. 
First, the regional ocean governance um, piece of the bill. The coastal states have been working together um, through the committee, the work group that I chair, to develop a proposal for regional ocean governance legislation. And this work is grounded in um, a policy statement that the National Governors Association put forward in 2007, which is attached to my written testimony. Um, in short, we agree that a, a national framework is needed to develop and implement integrated ecosystem plans. Um, in fact, 20 states are already involved um, in these efforts. Some of them were mentioned um, by Jack Dunnigan. Um, we need to recognize and build off the success of these voluntary state-led efforts and avoid being overly prescriptive and creating new bureaucracies. We think that regional plans should be action-oriented and directed towards achieving uh, shared goals and priorities, but that the requirements for them need to be realistic uh, and phased, and perhaps greater requirements could be phased in over time. We agree that we need more information to improve the management of our, our coasts and oceans, and we agree that a mechanism is needed to develop, fund, and implement regional plans. If funding is accompanied by other incentives, states will do this work without additional requirements to do so. Second, um, the, the statement of national ocean policy while we think that one is needed, we have some concerns about the way this provision is currently drafted and look forward to working together to resolve it. In terms of the funding, um, as you can tell from our um, comments, we need new funding to be able to do this. And I think there are several pieces of Oceans 21 that need to work hand in hand. It's all coordinated. With two seconds remaining, um, I'll thank you for your leadership on these issues and for inviting me to testify. Again, um, we look forward to resolving any outstanding differences or concerns in this bill, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Layden. And the chairwoman will now recognize members for any questions they may wish to ask the witnesses, alternating between the majority and the minority, and allowing five minutes for each member. And should members need more time, uh, we can go into a second round of questions. My first question is for uh, Mr. Jack Dunnigan. In your testimony, you go into great detail describing the Committee on Ocean Policy established by the President under executive order and how it represents one of the bold steps the administration is taking to implement the recommendations of the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. In that regard, I have two questions. First, if this committee is having such great success, then why are you opposed to codifying it in law? As you know, Mr. Donegan, executive orders come and go. And if we want to ensure the committee continues, it needs to be codified. Isn't that right? Uh, I, I think that's an issue, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. Thank you. I think that's an issue that we need to talk about. I think there's, there is perhaps an advantage uh, to moving forward and providing a, a stronger legislative basis for what uh, the President has done in, in the current structure. I think a lot of the concerns that we have with that portion of the bill are not just the questions of the codification of the Committee on Ocean Policy, but all of the other structural elements that the bill um, would bring in to be a part of, of the overall uh, scheme for managing that we think could be duplicative and end up taking um, a lot of our time away from actually doing the job of saving the ocean. Well, I, I certainly, uh, you know, understand your situation, and uh, the committee would like to have recommendations as to how we can smooth this out. Um, my next question is, at our hearing in March, Admiral Watkins said that despite the establishment of this committee, it was difficult to identify what the administration was doing in terms of new initiatives that were consistent with their recommendations. So can you identify specifically what NOAA and other federal agencies are doing that truly implement the recommendations of the Commission? In other words, how are things different than they were before the release of the report of the U.S. Commission? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I think that there are a couple of things that can be pointed to, and what I would like to be able to do is to uh, give back to the committee a, a very detailed response of the items that the various agencies, the administration have underway where we've been seeing a lot of collaboration uh, between the agencies. Let me talk about just uh, a couple of, of what those might be. Uh, first of all, we are seeing, in, in my experience of the long time that I've been in government, an unprecedented 
amount of collaboration where agencies are sitting down and actually talking about how they can do their jobs better together. This is being done through um, the various structures under the Commission on Ocean, po Ocean Policy, uh, the Subcommittee on Integrated Management of Ocean Resources, the Joint Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology are, are the two main operational arms. Uh, we have produced the uh, Ocean Research Priorities uh, document that lays out over a long term what, what all of the agencies together are seeing as the critical research priorities for our government to be able to move forward productively in the future. Um, we worked very hard as an administration with the Congress to see the enactment of the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act uh, reauthorization last year. And, and that was a, a very important part of the priorities that we brought forward. Uh, last June 15th, uh, the President declared the largest marine protected area on the planet, uh, the Northwest Hawaiian Islands National Marine Monument. And we are working aggressively now with partners and other agencies to implement that so that we can safeguard the heritage and the value of those resources for the people of our country. Uh, we are doing a better job of coordinating on marine transportation policy through the Committee on Marine Transportation Systems, where once again we're seeing a suite of agencies uh, sit down and work together in ways that we haven't in the past. So those are just a few examples, Madam Chair, of, of things where things are working better right now. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Donegan. And now the chair recognizes the ranking member, the gentleman from South Carolina. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mr. Donegan, the administration had 90 days to respond to the U.S. Ocean Commission report and its recommendation. The administration viewed these as recommendations, not mandates. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How did the various departments discuss the recommendations and determine which would be included in the President's action plan? Uh, there was a, a very broad collaboration that was led by the Council on Environmental Quality uh, that included an array of civilian and non-civilian agencies uh, focusing on the important items that, that we all saw. And there was a, a realistic ranking, we thought, of things that could actually be accomplished because the administration didn't want to just see this report end up being something that sat on a shelf. So we came forward with a specific set of actions that we thought would be achievable within a reasonably uh, recognizable time frame, uh, and uh, the President uh, took those recommendations and implemented the Ocean Action Plan. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Layden, in his written testimony, Mr. Dunnigan mentioned existing regional collaboration efforts, the Northeast Regional Ocean Council, the West Coast Governors Partnership, the Gulf of Mexico Alliance, and the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration. You have been involved in the Northeast Regional Council. Was it developed voluntarily, and has it worked well, and would the state support the continuation of these type of cooperative efforts? Yes, the Northeast Regional Ocean Council was developed voluntarily through the efforts of Rhode Island Governor Carcieri, um, who uh, really corralled the region's governors and made it an agenda item that was um, considered at the New England Governors Conference. We're just getting off the ground. We've identified four key priority areas. I have to say that the federal agencies, primarily through NOAA, um, were extremely responsive in coming to our initial meetings and helping us work through um, what the federal agencies thought the priorities were and how those corresponded to what the state view was. Um, we're having our first Oceans Congress um, May 24th bringing together people around the issues of coastal hazards, maritime security, ecosystem health, and energy. Um, yes, I where, where would that be? Where, would, where is that located? Where would that be located? The it's going to be located in Durham, um, New Hampshire, at UNH. OK, thanks. One other question. I, I have concerns with the creation of the Ocean Trust Fund and its budget implications. Your comments regarding the need to retain flexibility to fund programs priorities was important. However, the President hasn't asked for full funding for many ocean programs, leaving ocean programs as a lower priority. Without dedicated funding, how will the agency and the administration work towards getting more funding for ocean programs? Would you like me to respond, sir? Pardon? I, um, this is an issue that comes up 
continually to Congress in a wide variety of, of circumstances. Ocean funding is, is what we have in front of us today. Uh, we're concerned that uh, we, we establish a system that takes flexibility away from the President and the Congress to be able to address priorities um, as you have to face them every year and as they change. And when you, when you get into a system where you have dedicated funding um, that is not run through the budget process, uh, to that extent, the President and the Congress are losing their flexibility to be able to deal with, uh, with problems as they arise, and that is typically why um, many administrations over the years have tended not to like the kinds of proposals that, uh, that are included in the bill. Uh, I would point out, though, that the administration's, the President's budget for uh, fiscal 08 uh, includes significant new funding for uh, the oceans that hasn't been in the President's budget before. And we think that this came about as a result of all of the activity of the U.S. Commission and uh, following up on the Ocean Action Plan. And uh, we would strongly hope that Congress would be able to provide that funding uh, that's in the President's budget. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'll you back balance my time. Thank you very much, uh, Ranking Member uh, Mr. Brown. And now the Chair recognizes Mr. Falama Vega from American Samoa. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank Mr. Duncan and uh, Ms. Layden for their uh, fine testimonies this morning. I had indicated earlier in my opening statement about the concern of duplication, uh, overlappings, uh, the complication. Now, you know, we only have 280 federal agencies here in Washington, D.C., with some 220,000 people working under these 280 agencies already in existence. Now, I realize that you'd indicated, Mr. Dunnigan, the, you've got to give the President of the Administration some sense of flexibility, but sometimes also flexibility could also be to the point where we get nothing done. Uh, and this is the reason and the purpose why we pass legislation to make sure that we're on target, that we know exactly what the policy is. And I'm sure you'll agree with me, uh, ocean can sometimes be abstract in form. When you talk about three miles out in the ocean, we have a different set of laws for that problem. If you talk about 12 miles out in, from the, in the ocean, it's another set of laws. And then when you talk about 200 miles, that's what you call an economic exclusive zone that as an entirely different body of law also has to be figured into this whole process. So if I wanted to ask you, what do you talk about, what do you mean by ocean? The, I know what the Pacific Ocean because I live in the middle of it, but uh, and I can appreciate all our coastal states around the United States. So I have, I have a real deep appreciation of what an ocean is because I live right in the middle of one. So can, can you tell me if I'm being abstract about when you define what is the ocean that you're talking about? Uh, thank you, sir. No, I don't think you're being abstract at all. I think you're hitting on um, a critically important point that we're beginning to understand a lot more about than we have in the past, and that's how interconnected everything is. It's not just a question of uh, blue water or green water or brown water. It's a question of systems that engage each other and that people have to interact with and live among and a, and a wide variety of values that different people have with respect to those oceans. Um, we're active, for example, in um, a Gulf of Mexico hypoxia task force, which is an interagency task force that works with states. And recognizing that the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico is fed by um, things that come down the Mississippi River um, from a very wide part of our country. So I think the point you're making is that is that things are interconnected and ecosystems approaches towards considering them are essential if we're going to be effective. And you had indicated earlier, and I do want to give credit to the President for his initiative in establishing by executive order the Commission on Oceans Policy. May I ask, uh, how long have we been dealing with this in the Commission? I mean, on the, on the question of, as, as you had indicated, there will be an administration proposal by way of legislation. When do we expect to have that proposed bill? There will be an administration proposal on uh, the Organic Act for NOAA, I think was, was what I said. And uh, I think that you'll see that uh, within a couple of weeks. And I think that um, it, you, you, it won't be all that different from the one that the administration brought forward in the 109th Congress. Ms. Layden, I want to thank you for being uh, the outstanding leader of our coastal states and territories, and I hope we'll continue this organization to kind of keep an eye on what we're doing here, too, in Washington. 
I wanted to ask you, in terms of dealing with coastal states, you talk about the health of the oceans uh, and the coastlines. When we're talking about coastal states, how many people are we talking about? In terms of how does this impact or affect the people who live uh, along the coastal states? I mean, uh, what are we talking about? 20 million, 150 million Americans affected by the kind of policies that come from Washington that affects not only the ocean, but our coastlines. My um, staff member tells me that it's actually 53% of the United States population is within the coastal zone. 53, that's a little over 150 million being half, right, since we're about 300 million people living in this country? Okay, so you, there's a substantial number of people whose lives are impacted uh, for those who live in the coastlines, and then again, in terms of those that uh, at relates to our oceans policy. If I were to define what an oceans policy is, you're talking about marine resources, you're talking about fisheries, you're talking about the regulatory agencies that regulate and the other agencies like NOAA that promotes commercial fishing, if you will, recreational aspects that I know my good friend from New Jersey is very sensitive about, and rightly so. Uh, and so uh, uh, we've got a whole mix of, of, of issues and, and things that uh, we put it all together, it becomes chop suey. And I'm just wondering if it's gonna be delicious or it's gonna end up sour in terms of how we're trying to solve this problem. Is that a that, question, <laughs> sir? Yes, it is. I, uh, if I could maybe state it better, I know my time, 10 more seconds? Oh, is it passed? I'm sorry, my time's up. I, I, have, to, I have to obey my, my chair or she's gonna kill me. I'll wait for the second round, thank you. Let's just say we run a tight ship. <laughs> the chair now recognizes Mr. Gilchrist from the state of Maryland. Thank you, Madam Chairman. When I ask unanimous consent that my full statement be submitted into the record, uh, and I would also like, like to invite the entire committee, certainly with the with people that are testifying today, I keep forgetting to ask you this, we did it several years ago to come over to the first district of Maryland to go canoeing on the Sassafras River, which is a tidal basin to the Chesapeake Bay, and show you a number of things that we're trying to do over there on a local level to meet this integrated system that we're talking about this afternoon. So sometime late spring, early summer, the whole committee is invited to the Turner's Creek will the gentleman yield? picnic and a canoe ride. Will the gentleman yield? I will. I'd like to invite all my colleagues to come and visit my territory. Uh, we'll be there. But the only exception, 80. you pay your own fare company. You <laughs> thank you. And I'll, I'll round that out okay, with a visit you. to Guam. Visit no to objection. Guam. We'll, three places, Turner's Creek, American Samoa, and Guam. Okay. Um, I, first of all, I want to compliment the administration on its effort with Magnuson and basically helping us create this language that ended overfishing. And a number of other things were built on top of that. So we, we can conclude that that was a first step, a first big step in the right direction with our oceans. And I want to compliment all the NGOs that are in the room for the years of service to this issue. It's been pretty extraordinary. And I want to uh, start by giving a quote that I just read recently in the last couple of days. This was a quote associated with Vietnam and Iraq, but I think it also can apply here, and that is history is, the, is a vast early warning system and we don't have to go back too far in history to know the abundance that our oceans supply with a fragment of the population that we have today. Uh, and then we see the huge explosion of the human species across the planet, now relying on a minuscule of the resources that were there available to them as little as 100 years ago. And so when we look at that, and, and there's numerous examples that we can give, whether it's the Gulf of Mexico, whether it's the Chesapeake Bay, whether it's the Gulf of Maine or the Gulf of Alaska or almost anywhere you go. And I recently read an article, I think it was Palu, an island in the South Pacific and a number of other islands are going to do, follow this discretion. The ancient tradition in these atolls or islands was that you followed the natural cycles of the fish and you had certain areas that were isolated that you didn't fish because you not, knew that's where they spawned. And then when the larger fishing boats came in and traditions changed, they saw a drastic reduction in, uh, in the fish population that they depended upon. And so the elders have reinstituted that understanding of the integrated processes that they can observe every single day. So, uh, Jack, you mentioned the, the huge marine protected area. Uh, in the Hawaiian Islands region, and that's excellent. And we have protected areas in a number of places around the planet 
uh, not only the United States, but we cannot sustain life on the planet by hoping those isolated marine protected areas are going to do that. They're not going to do that. The entire planet is a protected area for the species that are, are, that are ongoing, that are growing. Um, a recent scientist said that the rest of the world, it is a virtual impossibility for the rest of the world to have the lifestyle, the standard of living in the United States with available resources. A virtual impossibility. So to, to find some uh, ability to understand the integrated effect of the air, the sea, and the water, and its impact by us, who up until recently had no understanding of nature's engineering design, but now we do. And so what, what I would like to continue, which is what both of you are suggesting, that we have Oceans 21, a bill, that reflects the two uh, public and private commissions about the need to look at the big picture, the ocean, the atmosphere, the land, how human activity degrades and is not compatible with nature's design, the big picture, not fragmentations in various committees or various agencies, but the big picture, and then for all of us to work together to create that structure that is um, reflective of the big picture. People assume, my constituents, constituents around the country assume that the government is competent. Now, we know that we would like the government to be competent, but we know all of the other various issues that enter the interplay of when we do our work from various interest groups, whether they want the whole world to be a marine protected area or whether they want the whole world to be a, a facility where we can extract resources for the immediate present and not the overall future. So, Jack, you mentioned um, 46 action items, of which most of them are, are done. Oh, I'm done. Okay. But anyway, let, let's, let's sit together and, 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 wor and work up a bill, a piece of legislation, statutes that are worthy of all of us here. Thank you. Mr. Gilchrist, uh, your witness can answer the question on the next round. Okay. <laughs> the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Frank Pallone. State of New Jersey. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I wanted to uh, start out by saying that I, uh, you know, I commend Mr. Farr and Mr. Allen for following up on the recommendations of the Pew Commission and the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy and in putting together this Oceans 21 legislation, which I do think is a good bill. And I, this idea of setting a national ocean policy to protect our marine ecosystems and resources is critical. And we also need to pass the NOAA Organic Act, which I understand is also incorporated in this. I think it's, uh, we need to find ways to increase coordination amongst the myriad agencies that address ocean and coastal issues, because too often those agencies are making decisions in a vacuum without considering the complexity of ocean systems. My questions, though, relate to fisheries management, because I, I mentioned to uh, Congressman Farr before that in my district, and I suppose nationally, but I only speak for my district, a lot of the recreational fishermen are concerned and saying that this is going to have a major impact and create a, a huge bureaucracy and make it more difficult to make fisheries management decisions. And I don't know if that's true. I mean, it may very well be that there's very little impact on fisheries here. Um, but let me just give you an example. Um, for example, and, and I'll ask uh, uh, the gentleman, Mr. Dunnigan from NOAA, these questions. Um, in, the, in Section 101 of the bill, it's, it sets a national ocean policy and requires that Federal agencies approve certain actions only if they will not significantly impact the health or restoration of marine ecosystems. Now, what I'm getting from the fishermen are statements like this, um, this, that this provision would basically mire fisheries management officials in new requirements and mandates that would make it difficult for the industry, hurt the commercial sector make it less competitive, uh, you know, create a whole level of new bureaucracy. And they use an example, for example, of, you know, would you be able to approve a quota for fishing, uh, um, you know, with a species that's not currently at maximum sustainable yield? 
Um, here, I'll give you an example right here. They say the National Marine Fisheries Service and the Mid-Atlantic Council could not set a minimum size on fluke or allow a limited harvest of spiny dogfish, you know, because of that. Do you see it impacting that in any way? I mean, you know, it, Congressman Farr tells me that's not the case, so I don't want to get into it. I'm not trying to relate it to him. I'm just asking your opinion. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to do fisheries these days, but every once in a while I well, maybe we run back all. into it. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the point you're making, Congressman, is one of the ones that, that causes us to have some concerns about the language of the legislation. Uh, the Congress and the administration worked so hard last year to get the Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorized, and we're working very hard to get it implemented, working with the regional fishery councils, that uh, it would be difficult, we think, to have to work in a whole other set of standards that come in on top of it. And, and it creates this next level of worry this perhaps next level of, of litigation possibilities that we're afraid are going to get in the way of uh, effectively moving forward with the implementation of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And that, that's one example. There are lots of other pieces of legislation where the similar kind of issue could play out. So uh, the, the concern that we've had in reviewing the bill is that it could lead to those kinds of problems, and we wouldn't want to see that happen. Now, what about Section 402 that sets up the regional ocean partnerships to help facilitate communications and collaborations? I mean, would they have any decision-making authority over fisheries management? Would they be able to step in and prevent a permitting decision, in your opinion? Uh, I'm not sure how it would play out, sir. I think you got our, the our Committee on Ocean Policy, too. These right. are all different, you know. Our, you know, our view is that fisheries ought to be managed through the council process, and we want to be able to support that. Uh, it, it's a difficult job, as you know, and, and they require uh, the resources and the attention that they could get. So I think, you know, we, while the idea of having a national ocean policy is one thing uh, that we should talk well, about. Well, let me just issue this because I, I know the time is problem. gone. You would probably suggest that we do some changes to avoid the possibility that these fishery management's decision would be impacted. I think we would want to have the chance to talk to you about that, yes. Sir. All right. That's all I'm asking at this point. Thank you. Chair, thanks the gentleman. And now I'd like to recognize uh, Mr. Saxon from New Jersey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Lady. I, uh, I have some questions which I would like to submit to uh, this panel uh, in writing for their answers. But I'd like to pursue the, the uh, subject and perhaps invite Mr. Farr to uh, express his um, views on this as well during my time. But <clears throat> it seems to me that there ought to be a way that, I mean, that's what this committee is for, to, to, to finalize language or to improve language. And uh, we all worked together last year on Magnuson, trying to, trying to develop an act, a law that would work to help conserve fish and at the same time, um, make sure the door stays open for uh, harvest of, uh, of seafood, both recreational and commercial. And the last thing that I'll tell you what, after Mr. Gilchrist and I and others went through, my knuckles are still healing up from that, <laughs> from that fight. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure Magnuson continues to go forward and work. And so, uh, Let's work together to, uh, to see if we can't solve some of these uh, problems. If, if, in fact, the people who are bringing up these, fact, these problems have a real problem, yeah. then we ought to fix it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't do something to emasculate what we did just last year. Let me yield to Mr. Farr. Thank you very much for yielding, Mr. Saxton. Let me point out that um, the, there is the next panel has a fisherman on it, Zeke Grader. <coughs> and I've worked with Zeke for 25 years. One of the things that what we've seen is that fishery councils only have the authority to deal with fish, fisheries. So what happens is if you have a, uh, any threat, they cut the quota because they don't have any other ability to deal with other factors that, are, that, are that may be uh, re related to but not a f in the fishery itself. That's why they're here to testify that we need a much broader policy and a coordination. In addition to that, the legislation, and you had a lot to do with this, you put in the bill that nothing in this act shall be construed to supersede or diminish the authority of responsibility under any other provision of law of any federal agency or state or political subdivision thereof 
to establish or implement more stringent requirements to conserve the ocean resources. So that still leaves it up to uh, local, um, local management and existing laws to do that. What is key to this bill is, uh, um, is this national policy. It's, you know, we uh, think about it. I mean, we, we, we are the only government that has jurisdiction over all this ocean mass. There is no state responsibility out to 200 miles. Uh, and if we are going to, if we're going to try to get a, a reduce this sort of conflict issue, which is what everybody's into, you've got to have a governance structure. Well, Madam Chair, lady, this, this, uh, believe me, uh, this, this is a subject that we're that we need to deal with, and uh, I look forward to working with Mr. Farr and Mr. Donegan and, and Mr. Pallone and others uh, to uh, to try to do something that will. Uh, Assure us that we'll have a workable process when we're finished. Thank you. And I yield. Could I? Um, well, I was going to ask him to sure. yield, but he just gave back his time. No, <laughs> I'll, I'll yield. Well, the time I, I just wanted to, uh, to uh, you know, okay. indicate that I totally agree with what uh, Mr. Saxton said, and I, I did talk to uh, to Congressman Farr briefly, and you know, I know that it's not the intention uh, here to, you know, change the fisheries management system. Um, but I also think it's necessary for us to sit down and to address it because we literally are, you know, getting, uh, you know, all kinds of attacks directly on the legislation. So we need to address it. But I, I understand that that's, you know, after talking to, to, to Congressman Farr, that there's no intention here to, you know, change the way the councils act or the way the fisheries management agencies proceed at this point. So I think that's significant. But I still think we need to talk about it a little more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Will the gentleman Mr. yield if he has 15 seconds? I think part of what uh, Sam is talking about with ocean governance um, is what was, has been mentioned a couple of times about lo what's local responsibility and what's local opportunity. Ocean governance has a way of pulling in uh, people to have some sense of obligation and responsibility and an opportunity to recognize the, uh, the ocean issues from an ecosystem perspective. Everything impacts the ocean. If, if you look at oysters, uh, it, it's not only that it, they were over harvested in the Chesapeake Bay, it's 99 percent of them gone compared to what it was 100 years ago, but it's also all the human activity and all the soil runoff and all the other degradation activities that have caused the oysters to drop down. So I think what we're doing in this bill is to deal with it in a, in a holistic approach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Chair uh, wishes to ask Mr. Saxon, did you have some questions you wanted to submit for the record? Was that yes, with no objection? And now the chair recognizes uh, Ms. Capps from the State of California. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I haven't had a chance to formally thank you for holding this hearing and uh, particularly appreciated uh, the first panel, um, one of whom is sitting next to me. Uh, and uh, I'm a um, co-sponsor of the Oceans 21 legislation. Uh, my district is contigu contiguous with Mr. Farr's on the Pacific Coast and have enormous respect for the four uh, co-authors of that legislation and I am proud to be part of the caucus that uh, from which it has come to and so pleased that this committee, a subcommittee is dealing with these issues and thank you to uh, all of our witnesses today in the three panels that we're having on this topic. Um, Ms. Layden, I'd like to start with you and actually my questions to you uh, are part of the context of the conversation we've been having already, but I want to frame it in a, just a little different way. I'm hesitant to release it into a conversation because I also want, I, I want to ask a, a question of our other witness. But you mentioned in your testimony several incentives other than just money to encourage state participation in regional governance. That's what we're talking about today, right now. One is a joint approach to the siting of energy projects and other emerging uses of the ocean. I'm, I have a particular interest in uh, your, uh, you know, fleshing this discussion out a bit on how this might work. Um, we had a discussion on this topic earlier this week at a hearing on renewables uh, in, on the OCS, and I immediately think of the CZMA and how important it was, is, and I hope will still be, and because it has let California have a say in whether or not new drilling would be allowed off our coast. We've had experience with this, and if so, under what conditions? You know, just recently, our Coastal Commission used this very law to reject a proposed LNG terminal uh, in my area that would have polluted our air and water. So my questions, I have two questions for you, and then I do want to go to the, our, our other uh, witness, too. 
Would the states want the responsibility for planning the siting of such projects in federal waters off their coast, and how would it fit with uh, federal uh, responsibilities? I think that there's certainly got to be a better way um, to site um, energy facilities that we all acknowledge that we need. Um, and to not end up in the situation that we're in now of going through extremely lengthy permitting processes and having facilities permits um, denied. So I think that this comprehensive approach to siting um, would be an extreme incentive um, of the regional ocean partnership type of framework. And I think states would look forward to that. I we, think it could be a streamlined approach where issues of concern could be identified early on and perhaps resolved. We had this such strong impression locally during this uh, recent application and, and the vote of the, of the Coastal Commission that the role of the Coastal Zone Management Act was so key in allowing uh, local communities, which after all are the most directly affected by any federal policy or decision, uh, to do to affect uh, even within federal waters uh, the both the, the state's jurisdiction and the local communities and that uh, I think the streamlining is affected in a positive way by having all of those uh, players stakeholders if you will at the table um, that now it seems like from the administration um, I'll let you answer that briefly but and go to Mr. Dunningan that uh, we have all the coordination and partnership that that we need uh, do you agree that we have the partnership and coordination mm -hmm. that we need. I think that um, it's more a creating a formalized framework around it and a system to get additional resources into the partnerships. I think the question was mentioned, I think it was by, um, raised by Mr. Brown about the voluntary nature and would these efforts continue. I think they're subject to the whim and the energy of the states right now. And right. the beauty of formalizing them is to get additional resources towards them. And so we're all meeting a common right. mark of achievement. And that is the that goes harks back to the importance of the federal role in making exactly. sure that this is this is done. Uh, I know I see the yellow light and I know, Mr. Dunnigan, I want to ask for your written reply because I just want to highlight a very important part of, of um, the the education budget through NOAA um, because we have this Be Wet program in, in my uh, district um, which is proven to be such a valuable piece and I want to make sure that the, uh, I want to see how you respond to the President's budget signaling education a, as a priority and what ways can we guarantee that that's going to stay a priority uh, through your administration. If there's a second for him to respond now and he can send me more in writing. Uh, Thank you, Congresswoman. And of course, in, in the National Marine Sanctuary that's in your district, right. uh, that the education outreach has been a major priority for us. The Merido program to get uh, education and outreach to non English speaking people. Right. Uh, so, and it's been a major uh, priority for Admiral Lautenbacher as the Under Secretary of NOAA to right. focus on education. So, the budget has to reflect that too. Uh, Otherwise, it doesn't work. Understand, and we'll be glad to follow up with a more complete response. Thank you very much. Okay. Chair, thanks. The gentlelady from California. And the chair now rep uh, recognizes Mr. Farr from California. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And it's just a privilege to be back on this committee, which I used to serve on many years ago. I just I have to respond to Mr. Dunnigan's comments. Mr. Dunnigan, I think you're very disingenuous to come and say the President's really up the uh, ocean's budget and we ought to all be thankful that the President's done it, when in reality he's cut the amount that Congress appropriated and enacted last year and has done that every year. We have gotten so in the hearing in Mr. Mullahan's subcommittee, I'm on the Appropriations Committee, not on that subcommittee, but in that subcommittee I got to sit in on it. And the, after hearing from Dr. Uh, Admiral Lautenbacher about what NOAA is up to in looking at their budget, which is the at, it's not only the oceans, it's also the atmosphere administration, the majority of the money goes into the A side, the atmosphere, the minority of the money goes into the oceans. And they have never been able to uh, come in and lobby. They just don't lobby for it. And one member of the committee said, we ought to just take the O out of NOAA. They don't care about the oceans anymore. My point is that I think to come here and say, you know, everything, just give us our statutory authority in the Organic Act, which is in this bill, but, re, but ignore everything else in there, 
is really disingenuous because the very commissions that went out and looked at the activities of the federal government, including that of NOAA, and the joint chairs, Dr. Uh, Admiral uh, Watkins and uh, Congressman Panetta, uh, reported to this committee in Congress just a few months ago about the, uh, they put out a report card, U.S. Ocean Policy Report Card. National Ocean Governance, C minus. Regional and State Oceans Governance, an A minus. Regional and State, that is not NOAA. International Leadership, NOAA ought to be part of that, D minus. Research, Science and Education, D plus. Fisheries Management Reform, primarily because of the work of Mr. Gilchrist and Saxton who led that effort last year, a B, B plus because of the passage of the Magnuson Act. And here is the last one, which is so key to it, that we wouldn't ha need this bill if indeed we had enough money to carry out the responsibilities of all and, and develop this interaction. We never have because NOAA has not done it. New funding for ocean policy and programs, which this bill is about and which Mr. Brown talked about, an F, an F. So that, I mean, I, that report card explains why we are here today and why we need to have uh, a national ocean policy to bring all these things in a coordinated fashion. And uh, I am just, um, you know, I, I guess what I am so upset about is we have worked so hard on this bill. There isn't an advocate in the Appropriations Committee that works harder to get money for the O in NOAA. And today you come and bite the hand that feeds you. Thank you. Uh, thank the gentleman from uh, California. Gentleman, he uh, took away my. Uh, Subject matter. I was going to read the report card, but I just want to ask Mr. Donegan, you, you mentioned earlier in your testimony that the funding was up to par. Uh, isn't the 08 budget request actually lower than the 07 appropriated level? Well, uh, Did Madam you say Chair, yes? the overall levels of funding that the country can make available for all kinds of programs are decisions that you get to make and Mr. Farr is a member of the Appropriations Committee. I know understands these things completely. Um, and uh, it is limited funding. I think what is important to recognize is that for, for what the administration has proposed in the past, there has been tr tremendous movement in this bill, this appropriation request for 08 in some very important areas for oceans and for ocean research. Uh, and it is not just NOAA. There are other agencies that are, are participating in this as well. So um, is, is, it the, is it the perfect answer at the end? Uh, that's a question that, that you all are going to get an opportunity to work out through your appropriation yeah, processes Mr. over Mr. the Mr. Donegan, uh, just an answer to my question, though. Mm -hmm. Isn't the uh, budget request for 08 lower than the 07 appropriation? Uh, for, for, for the NOAA. specific areas that we're NOAA. in? NOAA. Oh, for, for NOAA? That, no, that's true. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. The chair now recognizes the uh, ranking member, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, let me continue that, those same questions. So the bill appears to require a new level of approval and the requirement that any new ocean activities meet a new set of standards. How will this affect offshore aquaculture? And would individual permits be likely to face litigation if those opposed to aquaculture wanted to block new permits? Uh, I don't think we have a clear answer to that question yet, sir. The administration's uh, aquaculture bill, which uh, the Secretary has signaled as a high priority for the Department and for the administration, is going through its final steps of interagency clearance right now. And we'll have that um, you know, to bring up to Congress in the very near future. And I think we'll have a better opportunity at that point to look specifically at the questions relating to aquaculture. The, the and I might ask uh, Mr. Farr this question, uh, you might know it too. W what would be the fiscal impact on the uh, receipts of the new um, permits or license? How much would the, that generate in this bill? We don't have any uh, authorization in here for new. What we create is a, st is a federal stamp. Right. How much would that generate? I'm, we I'm, don't know. Okay. But that money would go back into uh, the program. It would it would um, recycle back into. Uh, do, do, you, do you know how HR 21 might affect aquaculture? 
Well, I think you, the fisheries expert sitting right to your right. Uh, uh, oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I missed that. <laughs> I, I mean, we have a lot of fisheries, too, but uh, certainly not like the Chesapeake has uh, okay. in aquaculture. But what, what you have, I mean, this, this is the difficulty. We have created a lot of stovepipe agencies throughout the years to deal with, you know, one, one thing. And what we find is when you try to solve a problem, it's comprehensive. It's, it requires a lot more. And the laws don't necessarily some of them in conflict. Um, and, and frankly, where you, where you get the uh, advantages for filing lawsuits is when the law is not clear. And, and you haven't been able to work out these things. We, we found in the coastal zone management, at least in California, because we have one stop in that requirement, one stop for federal agencies, for private sector, for local, I mean, usually governments that are exempt from these all come uh, and are required at, to be at the same table and come up with the same um, uh, outcomes to meet the standards. It, that's kind of a model, but it's not what we're doing here. We're not as strict as that. Um, that I, so the, it's going to be difficult to answer your question, but I can't think that it wouldn't be better, be more helpful to have, because then you can say this is where aquaculture ought to occur uh, and give it a green light. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And, and Madam Chair, before I yield back to balance my time, I'd, I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to submit Mr. Young's statement for the record. No objection. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, I can, I, can I clarify something? I made a mistake. Uh, I understand that the, uh, the aquaculture legislation has been sent to the Hill and was introduced yesterday by Chairman Rahal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, I just want to announce to the uh, panel here and to the uh, witnesses that are coming up on the second panel, we have three votes. Uh, so if the members, uh, I will, uh, I think we have Committee of the Whole, we have one vote. Is that correct? So I will recess for about. Our symbolic vote, if you yes, will. Yes, our symbolic yeah. vote for about 15 minutes and excuse and thank the witnesses of the first panel. And we will then begin after the 15 minute recess with the second panel. And I wish to thank you all. Madam Chair, I, can I just ask one or two questions to Mr. Dunnigan? Because I, 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 if it's all right okay. with you. Okay. Yeah. I think all right, but everybody else is excused. Oh, Mr. <laughs> Kennedy, too. I'm sorry. Yes, I'd like to recognize Mr. Kennedy from Rhode Island. Mr. Kennedy, would you like to uh, ask yes. a question? Yes. Um, if I could uh, ask uh, Ms. Layden, uh, if you would, um, in terms of uh, regional need for accountability measures, uh, um, <coughs> we're seeing in my state the um, uh, adoption of kind of the, the national standards in the Magnuson in terms of um, the ocean governance for fish species and lobstering, privatization basically of of um, of the of those fishing permits, you know, um, and it's <clears throat> leading so that you have to sell your rights to your uh, licenses to, to fish so that the only people who are fishing are people who can purchase the, the licenses. So we're now having uh, our commons, which are our oceans. It's our commons. It's the people. I mean, it's the oceans. It's public. Is, is the only people who get rights to that are the people who have the top highest bid. Um, you know, what can we do to, um, I mean, I, I know we have to protect our oceans, but I mean, and, and it, I know this bill is going to be doing a lot to try to develop policy in that area, but maybe you could give us some guidance as to what your opinions are on this difficult issue. I know it's been debated a million times, but. Well, I think that the, the beauty of Oceans 21 is that it's not focused on any one sector like fishing and doesn't attempt to change fisheries regulation. We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, it's the, w the intersection of fishing and oil development and et cetera, et cetera. And the intent isn't to negatively affect commerce. It's to do additional proactive planning that personally, I believe, is a way to um, perhaps achieve um, more equitable 
distribution or balance of development and conservation and perhaps um, you know, make it easier for, for offshore aquaculture if we can direct it to the right locations. But uh, like I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out, do you shorten the season? Do you change the gear? Do you, I mean, that's what I, when you say benchmarks and accountability measures, I mean, we're trying to get our hands around some specifics. We're talking in the, this particular legislation, um, my testimony was referring to benchmarks and accountability measures for the regional ocean strategic plans that um, the bill talks about um, what needs to be in a regional ocean plan, um, developing actionable items that may or may not include fisheries, um, and making steps towards achieving each of the strategies identified by the regions. No, I know, I, I appreciate that, you know, that you're talking in broad strokes on oceans protection, but, you know, it's, it is particular when you're talking about the oceans, you're talking about the natural resources in the oceans. I'm bringing this up because it's a hot topic now in my state, the ocean state, and uh, we've just had our own state governor limit the three mile uh, state waters to adopt the federal standards. So it's, it's the perfect reason as to why we need to pass this bill is because it's absolutely alienated all the local fishermen. Because they, if they weren't already alienated by the federal law, which they feel has you know, further limited their uh, historic right to, to the commons, now they feel doubly put down by the state um, effort to uh, imitate the federal rules. And so the point I'm making is that this is the reason why we need this Oceans 21 law is that we need to get to, to put down these benchmarks that you're talking about and these level playing fields and not have an arbitrary where the state of Rhode Island has one set of rules and another state has another set of rules. Um, but uh, that's what I was trying to get you to talk about a little bit um, in, in, in context of this fishing issue, because that's clearly where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, uh, with contention uh, with the fishing is, issue is where the most uh, contentious issues are, I'm sure you've seen, with managing natural resources. Maybe you could talk about how it applies. You see this, these policies applying at the local level. I think an example um, would be where a regional ocean um, council gets formed and decides that they want to um, improve water quality by, you know, reduce nutrients by X percent by a certain target date um, because nutrients are having a particularly bad effect in that region on um, marine habitats and species. So the accountability measure would be, did each of the jurisdictions adopt um, the necessary rules and regulations to achieve that, that goal? Oh, I see. So they all have to adhere to the same standards. Yeah, I got you. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Rhode Island. Uh, we do have to vote, so the chair wishes to recess this committee for 15 minutes and thank the witnesses of the first or second panel and bring up the third panel right after the 15 minute recess. Subcommittee hearing on the uh, fisheries and wildlife and oceans will now commence. And I want to thank the uh, panel, the third panel witnesses who are here with us today. Thank you for being patient. 
uh, and the rest of the members uh, should be coming in soon. Since I represent the territory of Guam, I can only vote in the Committee of the Whole. So that's why I'm back first. Uh, I want to thank and welcome Dr. Andy Rosenberg, the Professor of Natural Resources, Institute for the Study of Earth, Oceans, and Space at the University of New Hampshire. Ms. Sarah Chassis, Senior Attorney, Natural Resources Defense Council. And uh, uh, Mr. Zeke Grader, Executive Director of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. He is with us, right? Yes. All right, and Mr. David Benton, Executive Director of the Marine Conservation Alliance. I want to thank you all for being here today, and I would now like to recognize Mr. Grader to testify for five minutes, and once again, I remind the witnesses that the timing lights on the table will indicate when your time is concluded, and we would appreciate very much your cooperation in complying with the limits uh, that have been set. Uh, the rest of your full statement will be entered into the record. Mr. Grader. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank the subcommittee for inviting us to uh, be here to speak today uh, in regards to H.R. 21 and also to thank um, Congressman Farr and Congressman Allen for introducing this bill. Among the other fishermen that, uh, fishing groups that we represent on the West Coast are the commercial salmon fishermen, most of them in California as well as members in Oregon and Washington. And this really gets to the root of, of our interest in this issue of overall ocean governance. And it dates back really 30 years now. We had worked for the passage in, in 1976 of the Fishery Conservation and Management Act. But as we began implementing it, one of the things we quickly saw, and this was in particularly in regards to Pacific Coast salmon, is that, well, it was uh, fairly extensive and we've continued to improve upon it over the past 30 years, the Magnuson Act is the fact that all it does is regulate fishing. And that for a number of our fish stocks, the problems confronting those were not fishing related, but related, say, for example, to the loss of water in streams, loss of coastal wetlands, uh, as we're most recently seeing within the Gulf of Mexico, the brown shrimp fishery is being affected by the, the dead zone. So it became pretty obvious to us, and we began clamoring in 1977 to try and see what could be done to expand upon it so that the councils and the National Marine Fisheries Service could have more say over not just the fishing impacts, but the non-fishing impacts as well. We were met with a great deal of frustration during the Magnuson Act reauthorization of 85, 86, for example, when we actually came in with a package of, of uh, language that we suggested that be looked at to try and expand upon the uh, authority of the councils, but that was thwarted. I think about all that we got in at that time was finally a recognition of habitat, and I think they wrote the word in during that reauthorization, but that was about as far as it went. It's become fairly obvious to us that something had to be done to be able to get at the other factors affecting our fish stocks other than just fishing. Now, obviously, that's important, but, but for many fish stocks, it's not the only factor affecting the health or conservation of those stocks. And for that reason, we've become very interested and, and worked with uh, the Pew Oceans Commission, in particular, my former president had served on it as one of the commercial fishermen members on, on there in developing an overall oceans program that we felt could then help us do a better job of conserving and managing our fish stocks. In regards to H.R. Uh, 21, I think there, there are probably four particular parts to that that I think are uh, note that, that we're particularly interested in and very supportive of. First of all is, is the, the development and, and creation of a national ocean policy. I don't need to go into this. I think a uh, former congressman and, and uh, uh, Leon Panetta, who, chaired, who now chairs the Pew Commission, has done, a, I think, a great job in explaining the need for a, a uh, comprehensive ocean, national ocean policy. The second issue has to do with regional governance. Here again, we think it's going to be very important that we establish regional, some have called them ecosystem councils. Uh, there's been a great deal of fear that somehow this is going to create a new bureaucracy for fisheries. That's something that we're not interested in. We've got enough bureaucracy already, but rather the way we view this is these would not diminish the authority of the regional councils, but actually enhance them. Enhance them that they could then take these the issues that, that don't relate directly to fishing activities, bring them before these councils, and maybe get something done. 
Uh, the great example was, was where the, we saw the salmon closures the last two years off the Pacific Coast. Those closures had nothing to do with fishing. They had everything to do with water use policy. But we had no way of getting at those. So I think that's important. Two other important parts of this, of course, are the, I think, the creation of an ocean ecosystem resource information system and also the trust fund. We've got to have more money if we're going to protect our oceans. We've attached to our testimony a copy of a proposal we have for a fishery trust fund, but we need to develop an ocean trust fund as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Grader. And uh, you can submit your entire statement for the record. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Ms. Chases. You are recognized to testify for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, we very much appreciate this opportunity to testify today on Oceans 21. The overall message delivered by both the Pew Oceans Commission and the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy is clear. Our oceans are in trouble. We rely too heavily on our oceans for food, jobs, recreation, climate regulation, and our overall quality of life to ignore their decline. We lack some of the fundamental mechanisms and structures to address these declines, and urgent action is needed now to rectify these gaps. Oceans 21 is a direct response to that message and to that call for action. It provides a stronger, more coherent governance system for our oceans, both at the national and regional levels. We thank Congressman Farr for introducing it, the 29 co-sponsors for supporting it, and the subcommittee for holding this hearing. We have a better understanding ever, now than ever before of the threats facing our oceans. Moreover, the seriousness of the threats is increasingly being communicated to the general public by the popular media. And I would like to cite to the fact that there was this, an important series in the Los Angeles Times which just won a Pulitzer Prize, and it had to do with altered seas. And the April issue of National Geographic, the cover story was Saving the Seas Bounties. And there have been a series of programs on the Discovery Channel and uh, PBS about what's happening to our oceans. So I think you know, the public is, is really un coming to understand this. Scientific study after scientific study is showing that our oceans are in trouble. And that because ocean life is interconnected, impacts on one species can set off a chain of impacts and further shift the dynamics and composition of ocean ecosystems. Dr. Myers and others drove home this idea in a recent Science Magazine article. Overexploitation of large sharks driven by demand for shark fins and meat, as well as bycatch and other directed fisheries, resulted in the functional elimination of great sharks along the United States' east coast between 1970 and 2005. This, in turn, resulted in an explosion of great shark prey, such as rays, skates, and small sharks. These population increases, particularly of a particular kind of ray called the cow nose ray, resulted in a jump in predation of bay scallops. This led to, um, and, and that increase was sufficient to essentially terminate a century-long scallop fishery. It is not at all surprising that removing major players in ocean life would have impacts cascading down and across what was actually interconnected web of ocean life. In fact, this basic pattern has been well documented in the scientific literature. Both the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy and the Pew Oceans Commission found that a key reason our oceans are in trouble is a vastly inadequate governance regime. The U.S. Commission stated, and I quote, the nation is not now sufficiently organized legally or administratively to make decisions, set priorities, resolve conflicts, and articulate clear and consistent policies that respond to the wealth of problems and opportunities ocean users face. The Pew Oceans Commission sounded a similar theme. We have continued to approach our oceans with a frontier mentality. The result is a hodgepodge of ocean laws and programs that do not provide unified, clearly stated goals and measurable objectives. Authority over marine resources is fragmented geographically and institutionally. Principles of ecosystem health and integrity, sustainability and precaution have been lost in the fray. Both commissions called for major reform. The U.S. Commission called for a new national ocean policy framework. The Pew Commission called for a national ocean policy act. Oceans 21 directly responds to the recommendations. It establishes a national ocean policy. It provides a mechanism to implement that policy. It promotes effective coordination within the federal government and between states and the federal government. It establishes an ocean trust fund. 
Mr. Dunnigan raised the issue about whether there really was a need for legislation. We need legislation to provide an overarching policy direction to the numerous agencies that authorize the many different activities affecting the ocean and to ensure that action on behalf of the oceans will be taken not just by one administration, but every administration. The presence, President's executive order that established the Committee on Ocean Policy is not a substitute for this. Federal interagency coordination without a specified directive for that coordination is not enough. And the recent testimony of the Joint Ocean Commission initi initiative recognized this very specifically. An issue also came up in the earlier discussion about the relationship of Oceans 21 to other laws. This legislation does not minimize the importance of legislation addressing individual sectors or issues. The bill before you today, Oceans 21, does not seek to replace other legislation, but rather provide a means by which individual laws and activities can be woven together into a more cohesive and effective whole that preserves the integrity of the systems. In conclusion, the ocean area under U.S. jurisdiction is 23 percent greater than the entire land mass of the United States. It is time to respond to the call of the two national commissions and give this part of our national heritage the attention it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chases. Uh, we'd like now to recognize Dr. Rosenberg, and you are recognized to testify before the committee for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to members of the committee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today concerning the future of U.S. ocean policy. I'm Andrew Rosenberg from the University of New Hampshire, I'm a member of the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy and the Joint Oceans Commission Initiative. I'd like to compliment the committee and the sponsoring members of H.R. 21, and today I'd like to address five major areas in my testimony that are relevant to your deliberations on this bill. Those five areas are ecosystem-based management as a guiding principle for ocean policy, the creation of a consistent policy for new uses of the ocean, strengthening the Coastal Zone Management Act, the importance of integrated ocean observing systems, and an ocean policy framework that then help address the ocean effects of climate change. Part of the mission of the lead ocean agency must be ecosystem-based management of U.S. coastal and ocean areas. The essence of an ecosystem-based approach focuses on five basic principles focusing on the ability of an ecosystem to continuously provide a full range of services to support human well-being, recognizing that management actions must be framed uh, with respect to natural boundaries, recognizing the various sectors of human activities on the oceans interact and their management must be integrated, and recognizing that the impacts of human activities are cumulative on ocean ecosystems, both in time and in space, and that trade-offs in services among, among sectors must be explicitly addressed in policymaking. The nation's ocean policy should recognize these principles and seek to integrate management within regional ecosystems with a result of healthier ecosystems and more coherent management systems that work better for the public and for business. NOAA will best take on the challenge of ecosystem-based management with a new structure that integrates across the currently fragmented functions of the agency. A NOAA Organic Act should begin that work of reducing program frag fragmentation, but I know that this is not just a NOAA problem. It is fragmentation across the government, so we need to give NOAA the tools to work with other agencies in order to reduce that fragmented management system. A whole new set of challenges are rapidly emerging for coastal ocean of the U.S. because of the development of offshore energy facilities, aquaculture, desalination plants, among others. These new uses require an allocated of dedicated ocean space in many cases, and conflicts are rapidly emerging. To take two examples near my home, the siting of an offshore LNG port near Gloucester, Massachusetts, and the proposal to build an offshore wind farm in Nantucket Sound, well, of course, there are NEPA requirements for such activities, but what are the standards for deciding where a wind farm should be located to the benefit of the nation, or an LNG port? How should the conflicts with fishermen, recreational users, coastal landowners, and residents um, and the public be resolved? What are the policy elements that businesses should be mindful of as they plan investments? And how do we end up with a predictable system for both business and the, and the public so they know what they can do and how to do it? Right now, we don't have that framework, and H.R. 21 begins to establish it, but it is an urgent need because these new uses are moving very rapidly. The Coastal Zone Management Act is in need of revision to meet the challenges of ecosystem-based management. State coastal management plans are the appropriate means to improve land use planning in the coastal zone, but a consistent set of strong guidelines are needed. 
planning must be integrated with the management of many activities occurring in the coastal and ocean areas, and the example given by Mr. Grader is an excellent one of why that's so important. Coastal management doesn't need uniformity, but it does need coherence around the country. Again, predictability is important, and, and the ability to adapt to changing conditions. This means a stronger criteria as the basis for management plans, including a watershed focus, not just the narrow coastal zone. The integrated ocean observing system, with respect to the integrated ocean observing system, we need more coastal and ocean science urgently, but we need to bring together the fragmented data sets that currently exist. There must be a system of ocean, real time ocean observations of the environment, but it must include the biology of, and, and ocean based activities to be a tool for policy making. We must relate ocean conditions to living resources directly and to the human activities on the ocean. And to me, it seems a bit absurd that we create a high technology system for ocean observing, but we still monitor fisheries and other ocean activities by passing around little slips of paper. Congress needs to fund a comprehensive and sustained ocean observing system that will support ecosystem-based management. And then finally, anthropogenic climate change is occurring, and it is affecting the oceans. And a new policy direction for the ocean, new agency mandates, coordination and structure, and new tools for ocean research management and education must be implemented quick, quickly, and they must be able to include the concerns about climate change issues. We can't set an ocean policy today, a new ocean policy today, that doesn't think about climate change as a major factor affecting the oceans. Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I'd be pleased to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosenberg. And now the chair recognizes Mr. Benton to testify for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, uh, I too want to congratulate the committee for holding this hearing and uh, providing this opportunity to uh, provide you our views about uh, H.R. 21. Um, you have my written statement. Uh, for the record, I'm David Benton with the Marine Conservation Alliance. I just want to respond to some of the things that, that have, I've heard here today uh, in the hearing. Uh, I think my written statement speaks for itself, although I have one mea culpa, Madam Chair. Uh, in the last edit while I was on the airplane, it was supposed to be addressed to Madam Chair, not to Mr. Chairman, and we will make a change to that and submit it accordingly. Um, You're excused. <laughs> thank you. Um, but do I get an extra two minutes? <laughs> anyway, Madam Chair, uh, the Marine Conservation Alliance represents about 80 percent of the seafood production in Alaska. Alaska represents about half the seafood production in the country. Uh, our members uh, come from all walks of life in the seafood industry, harvesters, processors, coastal communities, and, and our, our interests are in finding practical solutions to real world conservation problems and do that in a timely and cost effective manner. And we share a lot of the kinds of concerns you've heard here today about uh, bringing management systems together, making them more cohesive, making them more effective, and making them more efficient. And we are very supportive of moving towards ecosystem-based fisheries management or management of other marine resources and, and doing so in a way that's based on good science and a transparent public policy. The problem that I see with H.R. 21 is that because of the way the bill is presently constructed, that doesn't mean we can't fix it, but because of the way the bill is presently constructed, it does not achieve those goals. And in fact, our concern is, is that it could get in the way of making the kinds of progress that we need to get, uh, to get accomplished in this country. And I'll give you an example. The, the, the national standard that's in this bill is, is fine enough for certain kinds of activities in the, in the marine environment, but it's basically a monofocused national standard around ecosystem management. There are other things that go on in the marine and coastal environment that also should be part of a national policy, transportation policy, uh, energy policy, uh, national defense policy. This policy does not get to that. It gets to one aspect of marine uh, events and uses. The, national, uh, st uh, the standards for implementing the national policy are, are very rigid and very prescriptive. They don't provide the kinds of flexibility that, uh, that you need to have in a real world management sense. There, all federal actions that are covered under this bill would be required to, to demonstrate that they are not likely to harm a marine ecosystem, any marine ecosystem. And that's going to be a very difficult challenge to make. And, and, and managers are going to have a very difficult time meeting that standard and doing it in a timely fashion. Our concern is the interaction between the national standards, the definitions in this bill, uh, 
are going to cause a, a system of gridlock and not do what I think the proponents of the bill are trying to get done, which is to streamline things and make them more effective and to bring a different level of conservation ethic into how we make decisions. We think it's going to get in the way. The other, other kind of, of concerns that we have here is the creation of a fairly large and elaborate and expensive bureaucracy. Uh, we've got a lot of bureaucracy now. Uh, the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy pointed this out very well, and they, they, they laid out some steps that could be taken, but those steps were largely built upon uh, improving existing programs and making uh, the best use that we can of what we have instead of a new bureaucracy that lays over the top. The third thing I want to touch on really quickly is funding. Uh, the bill sets up the trust fund. Uh, we think having a, an oceans trust fund might be a very good idea. The difficulty is that it, the only new source of money is a national stamp. Uh, nobody seems to know how much money that would generate. Uh, we don't think that's going to generate a billion, three hundred million dollars uh, uh, a year. Uh, so money is going to have to come out of the general treasury. With the physical realities that this country is facing, and you face this all the time here in this, in this town, uh, unless you can identify a new source of money, that means that those general treasury funds that are going to go into that trust fund are going to come and be scored against some program, and we're concerned it's going to be scored against oceans, science, and management programs that already exist. Without a new source of money, the trust fund is simply moving money around and, and shuffling the decks on the Titanic, and we can't afford to do that. And with that, Madam Chair, I'm going to beat the clock, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Benton. Uh, I'm going to um, go ahead and recognize the members. Of course, I'm the only one here right at the moment. <laughs> uh, but I do have questions for each of the witnesses, and hopefully my colleagues will be returning soon. And uh, I know, Mr. Grader, you have a plane to catch uh, later on. How much time can you be with us? I've probably got about another seven minutes. Oh, well, good. <laughs> Just time for my question. Um, this has to do with the trust fund. Uh, the administration testified that they oppose the establishment of a trust fund because it somehow limits their ability to identify and fund priorities. Has it been your experience that the programs needed to better manage our fisheries and oceans have received the funding they need by relying on the prioritization process of the administration? No, they, no, they have not, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, and that's been one of our concerns. We, we started beginning clamoring for a trust fund well over 10 years ago and, and, and basically designed a model for both an ocean and uh, a, a fishery trust fund. But part of the problem we've gotten into trouble in fisheries in this country was not just, just greed or avarice, but was ignorance because we simply did not have the adequate funds to do the research that was required. And we still don't. And so I think from that standpoint, and, and looking larger at our oceans, uh, we need to have a steady source of funds. The one thing we looked at as a model, albeit a small one, was the uh, Sport Fishing Restoration Fund, which has been a very popular program funded by a, um, uh, a tax uh, on all sporting goods, uh, sport fishing goods sold, as well as on the marine uh, diesel, or marine gasoline, I should excuse me. That's raised a lot of money. The monies are then uh, uh, administered by the Fish and Wildlife Service and go back out to the states for the programs. That's been an extremely popular program, and I think the, uh, you know, development of a of a trust fund for our oceans is good. We share Mr. Benton's concerns that that the uh, money identified in here is not adequate. But on the other hand, we see this as positive, much as we did with Magnuson. At least we started. We got the, a trust fund concept started. Then I think in both the case of fisheries and in our oceans, we do need to identify other sources. For fisheries, we've done that. We haven't done that yet for oceans. All right. I'd like to ask uh, every member of the panel, because I think Mr. Benton zeroed in on that, uh, the trust fund. Uh, you all agree we need more money. Uh, where do you think we should get it from? I'd like to ask Ms. Uh, Chases. Well, I think uh, we agree with Zeke that um, the idea of creating the fund and and making sure that, you know, one thing that's important is not only making sure money is set aside in the fund, but that it's mandated to be spent. Um, because we've seen with other programs like the Land and Water Conservation Fund that money goes into it, but then uh, we don't see it coming out. 
Um, we think that um, there are potentially other sources of funding that could go into this. The, the kind of proposal that Seek's group has put forward in terms of a seafood tax, potentially. Um, one area that we've been concerned about including that um, has sometimes been the subject of discussion is offshore oil and gas revenues. And we would want to, you know, look at that kind of proposal very, very carefully. We certainly don't want to have, have funding sources which actually encourage activities which could be more damaging uh, to the ocean than, um, you know, when the goal here is really to try to protect the, uh, the ocean. Thank you. I'd like to ask next Dr. Rosenberg the same question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the Commission recommended uh, some specific sources of funding for an ocean trust fund, and I do think it's very important that it be an ocean trust fund for a range of uses. There are fisheries issues, but there's many others. Um, certainly, the uh, use of offshore oil and gas revenues is difficult. And we recognize that, of course, it's always a little bit of a zero-sum game of, of trying to move money from one place to another. I think it is important to recognize that ocean-related uh, activities, ocean science and education, have been underfunded for quite a while. And so the decision with regard to oil and gas funding, I think, um, is, is certainly a matter of priorities between competing uses. Um, but one part of the Commission recommendation that hasn't uh, perhaps been fully appreciated is that we recommended that the new uses of the ocean that I mentioned in my testimony, including aquaculture, including wind, you know, offshore energy facilities, LNG ports, and so on, are potentially, since they require a dedicated ocean space, public um, trust uh, space, that they are potentially an important source of funding. And there has been no decision, um, or uh, as far as I'm aware, no extensive discussion of that particular potential source of revenue. It also argues for having a consistent and comprehensive um, system for managing those new uses as they come up. And so I think that that is an important source of revenue that should be considered in development of this trust fund along with some of the other competing uses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosenberg. I've listened to the three of you. Of course, we're going to hear from uh, Mr. Benton. But uh, this is why we're having this, this uh, hearing, to get ideas and uh, some of them are very interesting, and certainly the committee will take note. Mr. Benton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, I, I concur with uh, Dr. Rosenberg and, and with Ms. Chases in their comments uh, about where to find monies. I know that offshore oil and gas revenues are a difficult, uh, at least uh, philosophical issue, and they have some practical, practical issues as well. One thing that, uh, that uh, occurred to me sitting here was that a few years back, uh, there was a bipartisan bill, uh, I think it was authored, in fact, by Congressman Young from my state uh, to create a, a conservation trust fund. I can't remember exactly the name of it, uh, but I think we could certainly pull that back up and, uh, and see where the revenue sources for that um, were going to come from and see uh, if, if uh, that might provide an avenue to pursue. That, that bill had a fair amount of support from at least some of the conservation community, as I recall and uh, was, I think, a bipartisan bill, but we could certainly do that, and I'd be happy to, to work with you and committee staff to find that if you want. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Benton. Um, I have a question here for uh, Dr. Rosenberg. Um, I think you were in the room and you heard Mr. Dunnigan, uh, Dunnigan testify in opposition to the bill. Uh, his point was that the President's executive order and the U.S. Ocean Action Plan are more than sufficient and we don't need any legislation to achieve the recommendations of the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. Based on your experience as a former administrator within NOAA and a member of the U.S. Commission, would you agree that the President's efforts satisfy the Commission's recommendations and that no legislative measures are needed? Um, thank you for the question, and no, I would not. I think the report card that the Joint Ocean Commission initiative makes that fairly clear that um, the commissioners on both commissions really don't um, believe that the current efforts are, are nearly sufficient. Um, specifically with regard to the Ocean Action Plan, um, not only with funding and some of the international issues, but um, in thinking about the ecosystem-based management approach, um, NOAA is certainly working very hard and trying to do good things. I have no question of that, and I worked for the agency for 10 years and a, a strong supporter. 
but they need to take a new direction, and that's very difficult to do when you're in the same structure you've been in for a while with the same mandates that you've had for a while, just by telling people to work more nicely together. Well, and when your funding is declining. And your funding is declining. The, the, one of the difficulties with a lot of the discussion of ecosystem-based management and, and, in fact, this bill is that people are assuming it's just an add-on. We're going to do all the things we're doing now, but then we're going to do some additional things, and where will the money come from? And that was the sense of, of Mr. Dunnigan's comments. I think the argument within the Commission, um, or from the Commission, is that we're saying we need to do things differently. We need to connect up those programs differently, not just add the layers, as I think Mr. Benton referred to. And that's a difficult task for an agency that's been in existence for 37 years to to make changes in directions. Are they doing some things? Yes. Is it sufficient? No, it is not. Thank you. Ms. Chasis, would you like to comment on that? Yes. I think that, um, you know, there is the Committee on Ocean Policy that's created by the President's executive order, but there is no clear direction uh, of policy to that entity. And I think uh, Congress really is the one that needs to provide that direction in order for us to see the real coordination and um, direction of, uh, in terms of ecosystem-based management that, that we need and that the two commissions uh, requested. And also, you know, we need something that's permanent, that's got longevity, and something that's just created by one president uh, through executive order just does not have the same stature or importance as a piece of legislation uh, that Congress has, has enacted. So I don't think the responses of the administration are at all satisfactory to the concerns that our community has and that the two commissions have. Thank you. You, you mentioned something on one point that I keep bringing up. I served in the executive branch in my community uh, government as a lieutenant governor, and executive orders are executive orders. They come and they go. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may not be uh, what the next administration wishes to carry out, so very simply. But, uh, you know, when you work through Congress, you know that it's something permanent, and I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Mr. Benton, do you have any comments on that? Well, Madam Chair, I, I, um, I think that the administration made a, first, a good first stab at trying to pick up on the recommendations from uh, the, the U.S. Ocean Commission. I have no problem if uh, if the Congress wants to establish in statute, uh, you know, a policy advisor in, pre in the executive branch and and the president's uh, office and and that committee. Um, I I don't think when, I don't think that's going to uh, make a a huge difference uh, whether it's established by statute or not because. And I simply I agree with your statement about you know executive orders come and go, but there is so much attention and interest in the oceans that I believe for the foreseeable future, next several presidents down the way, this is going to be a major topic for the country. They are going to they are going to follow in those footsteps. If well, if, if and if I may, the the real issue comes down to some other pieces of what the president started, what the commission recommended and where we really, I believe, need to be focused. The, the integrated ocean observing system is a very important piece. We will not be able to do ecosystem management well if we don't have a much more improved data set to operate from. And those kinds of things, those kinds of recommendations are the ones that we need to be picking up on. They are not dealt with well in this bill, and this bill could get in the way of that unless we solve that funding issue. And the President started down that road but he has not finished that job at all. Uh, uh, Dr. Rosenberg, you had your hand up. Yes, if I could just add one more thing, Madam Chair, um, and that is the, with regard to the, the National Ocean Council, the Commission recommended certainly that uh, there should be a council and that it should be an advisor to the President on ocean policy. But a, a critical issue is how will NOAA actually um, get the other agencies to engage. I mean, this is not just a NOAA problem, even though much of the discussion has been focused on NOAA. And in a National Ocean Council, unless you have a clear policy direction that is national and they have a task to do with regard to a set of standards or a specific policy statement, it will be very difficult for a relatively small agency like NOAA to, to go to the Navy or NSF or EPA or Department of Transportation 
and get them to pay attention to those same issues unless there's some, something pushing them to do so. And that's why I think it's very important to have a clear overarching mandate from Congress that says to do that. Yes, the President could direct the, his secretaries to do so, but without a clear imperative of what they're supposed to do, oh, I, I just don't think that they're all going to come and come to the table and work together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosenberg. Well, you know, we can speak forever on this, but we're here to get input from all of you to, to make this a better piece of legislation. But I wouldn't want to be working under an executive order. That's for sure. Because no matter how important this particular subject is, and it will continue to be of great importance in the future, it's just good to have that permanent feeling of knowing that no one can make any changes, and we've got a piece of legislation behind us, and, and we're permanent. That, to me, is very important. And I'm very happy that um, the uh, father of this bill is here, back with us, uh, Congressman Farr, and uh, I've tried to stretch it out as long as I could till everybody got back, so I'd like to uh, recognize uh, uh, Representative Farr. Thank you very much. I'm, I really appreciate even continuing on if um, I know our witnesses, some had to catch planes, and most of the members of Congress, when I ran out after this last vote, are already in, on their, in the airport. I mean, they just ran for their cars. So this town is emptying, or em, it's emptying right now. Um, and I think it's important that you were able to get all the panels uh, to participate, because we oftentimes uh, cut off the, the, the panels, and I, and I appreciate your leadership on this. Um, I really have no questions. I'm just very excited that we had a, a, a you know, very good uh, observations today, if not and some in committing that this is a great bill and a great in the right direction, but the whole recognition that uh, status quo does not solve the problems. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the first line of trying to solve a problem is you've got agreement that something's broken that needs fixing. And uh, I think from there we can make great progress. Thank you very much, the gentleman from California, Mr. Farr. I have uh, another question for uh, Ms. Chases. Uh, both the administration and the Coastal States Organization oppose the requirement under Title I that federal agency actions be administered in accordance with the National Ocean Policy, arguing that it will create a bottleneck that will block activities from occurring. Do you agree? And if not, why not? How will this process work? No, we don't agree. Um, I think that the language, first of all, you, you have a policy, you need a standard uh, that's an action forcing standard to get agencies to actually implement the policy in particular contexts. And I think uh, the language of the standard is, is carefully constructed so that it's really focused on activities which could impact the ecosystem. It's a pretty high standard. It talks about significant impacts. It talks about likely impacts. It talks about ecosystem level impacts. So it's really trying to get at those things which go to the health of the system. The other point is it's not trying to replace the mandates of other law. That issue I think came up earlier. What it's saying is integrate this policy with the other mandates, it mandates to the maximum extent you can. Don't you know, if, it's a, if there's an inherent conflict between the mandates of another law and this, that's, you know, the other law holds. But to the extent there's discretion, this is in a sense like the way it works under the Coastal Zone Management Act, you, you're requiring agencies to be consistent with this policy to the maximum extent possible. So we think it's, a, it's an important action forcing mechanism. It's not designed to, to block things in the oceans. It's trying to say, look at, uh, the things that are really going to have major impact and make sure that the overall functioning of the system is is maintained, which is needed to support fisheries, to, def to support all these other uses that are so vital. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chase. Does uh, the other panelists wish to comment on that? Ms. Ms. Dr. Rosenberg and then Mr. Benton. Um, I think it's very important to, to have a national ocean policy and standards, whether the, the language of the standards um, you know, is exactly uh, 
exactly right or not is, is a matter that certainly the Joint Ocean Commission initiative would be happy to work with the committee on. The reason that I think it's so important um, is because I do think you need to have federal agencies engage on this issue. And oddly enough, I think that the, the least problematic area is fisheries, because fisheries already has to do this within their existing statute. And so all the concern is that this is going to change fisheries management, and I don't think it will. If, in fact, you adhered to the Magnuson Act, you'd have to do this anyway. And so there isn't really anything new, no new requirement for fisheries, in my view. Um, what is a new requirement is that if you're taking some other action uh, that may impact on that ocean ecosystem that fisheries depend upon, um, whether it be a transportation action or other develop or new use in the ocean, that you have to explicitly consider those ecosystem function issues um, and the ability of the ecosystem to maintain itself. So I think it gives exactly what um, Zeke Greider referred to as the ability of, for example, fishermen who depend upon the ocean to have an entree into many of the other issues that are um, problematic for them, but they really don't have an entree into now. And if I go back to the LNG port in New England or the wind farms in New England, how is the Fishery Management Council or the state fisheries agency able to impact upon the siting discussions with regard to LNG ports, even though it became an exclusive use that you know, many fishermen in the town I live in said was going to have a major economic impact on them because of the exact location they chose. They had no way to get into that process other than public comment. And they should have more of a voice than that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rosenberg. Mr. Benton? Well, I, I um, Madam Chair, I, I see uh, the, the present language. I, I have to agree with the administration with regard to the way the present language is constructed. Now, I, I can see a way, and I think Mr. Rosen, or Dr. Rosenberg and, and Ms. Chase has both identified that there's probably ways to improve the language a bit to avoid uh, what may be an unintended consequence. But the way the language is presently constructed, uh, all actions by any federal agency that may affect an ocean ecosystem have to go through this filter. And the, the filter, the standard is uh, that that action, the agency has to certify that it's not likely to harm any marine ecosystem. And, and that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to do in a real world sense. And so in my written testimony, I, 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 uh, I think I pointed this out fairly uh, pointedly. And, and I can see some real problems. I spent 14 years uh, with the state of Alaska as a fishery manager in the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. I did the international negotiations. I did all the council stuff. And then I served as a, as a uh, private individual on the Fishery Management Council. And I can tell you just from that practical experience, this kind of language, depending on how it's implemented and depending on how it's put in regulation, uh, this could be a real problem. There's a way to fix that, I believe. But the way it's presently constituted, I could see some real difficulties. And uh, I, I know people are trying to get at other kinds of activities. Uh, you know, some of the coastal zone, de development in coastal zones or, or effects like an up, you know, upriver that's affecting salmon. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that. I've seen it the other way. I was the U.S. negotiator uh, uh, along with uh, some counterparts from Washington State uh, on a salmon treaty with Canada. One of the big problems in that treaty uh, was uh, threatened and endangered salmon in the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest. And the, uh, the effects that uh, habitat degradation were having on those salmon. And it was a legitimate concern. It was, you know, those, they were listed, and that's a big problem. What happened was that the, uh, the Canadians and some folks from the southern United States tried to use that as a negotiating tactic in an international treaty. And they um, they, they were using very inappropriately those kinds of considerations, which were in many ways domestic considerations, to leverage other parties in those negotiations uh, to do things that were not biologically necessary. And I could see this standard sort of having that same kind of unintended, I, I believe unintended, consequence. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be very cautious. Thank you, Mr. Benton. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Farr. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, I would just uh, like to ask Mr. Benton because, first of all, this, that, that's, that idea of, having, uh, of, of measuring the impacts, 
has been the essence of both of the reports. If you ask what was the bottom line, it's, well, what are the activities in the, the, activities in the ocean, what do they do to the ocean's ecosystem? And um, everybody says, yes, we need to do that, but how do we do it? And, and I guess my frustration is we've had this language around, this has been the essence of this bill for now uh, about four years. And, uh, you know, we haven't gotten a lot of comments on it. I mean, just other than sort of the generic concerns, I'd really like, if you have some specifics, because I, I guess the question is, who would you exempt? Because that begins the exemption. Should you exempt the Navy? Should you exempt uh, fishermen? I mean, the qu question is, how do, you, um, how do you measure impacts that would degradate uh, the health of the ocean without having uh, these plans at least trigger what kinds of decisions are going to be having an impact. Uh, you know, we don't have any uh, we don't have any process for that, and and that's what's lacking, and why we need to have some of the strategy and and this approach. I I'd, I'd be glad to work with you on on language because um, we certainly want the Alaskan support. Mm -hmm. It's it's ironic that. Uh, Don Young was the one that actually got this bill through the House. There was a conflict here. I mean, people said we don't need to study it. It was that attitude, you know, we don't need another commission. Uh, he saw the, the, uh, the necessity to kind of get these problems resolved by creating a commission that could hold hearings all over the country. And, and frankly, you know, they appointed a lot of oil and gas folks to be on that commission. And uh, we, were, we were delightfully surprised to see uh, how strong they came out about needing this governance structure and essentially measuring uh, actions in the ocean, including their own, uh, uh, against uh, negative impacts. And so uh, it's, we can't abandon this, this idea. This is the foundation of the bill. But we certainly can work with ways to mitigate uh, unintended consequences. Madam Chair. Please, uh, Mr. Benton. Um, Congressman Farr, I, I, um, I certainly agree with you that, um, that the message that came out of the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy was that we need to take a good hard look at how we're doing things and make it better. And uh, the notion that they came up with uh, about, for example, the regional ocean uh, councils um, had some appeal uh, up our way. Uh, when they were, they were, you know, they were more or less a voluntary kind of thing, um, and you could move yourself along in a in a in a uh, um, in sort of a deliberative, thoughtful way to get to that broader ecosystem management goal. And we don't have a problem with that. And in fact, in our part of the world right now, um, our my group. And our fishery management council is doing a fishery ecosystem plan for the Aleutians. It's the first one for our part of the world. Uh, they've also organized, they were spark plugged with the state of Alaska. What basically it was the recommendation of the U.S. Commission for a regional oceans council. It's got the Coast Guard. It's got the, all the state agencies, all the federal agencies. Uh, it's got some uh, users on there. Not too many user groups right now because the agencies are still trying to figure out how they're going to do that dance. Um, the governance structure, that kind of government, governance structure is not the big, biggest problem that I see. What I see is, is in some of the specific language in, in, the, in the way the standards might interact. And, and in that regard, I, I'd be happy to work with you in the committee and see if there's a way that we might be able to, to try and shape that in a way that alleviates some of those concerns. I just see them as being a very high bar and, I, and, a, and the standard being vague enough and difficult enough with the judicial review provision here, my good colleague down here, Sarah Chase, this is going to have a full employment career uh, for the rest of the days, and she's going to be able to, to uh, get the scholarship for her, her kids uh, well paid off. I just want to respond to that and point out that the very, one of the first cases I ever brought was on behalf of Mr. Benton. So. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, he he the, shouldn't be one to complain. <laughs> I think we're using the word standard here very loosely. The, the, the ideal here is, is kind of a goal, uh, not a standard. The standards have to be worked out. 
And the, and the only this thing I would have to say to you is that I've been involved in these where you sort of you can do the model well in your own backyard and you really solve the problem. And I applaud Alaska; it's getting a lot of accolades. You're really doing a wonderful job of, of meeting with the the environmental concerns and the fishery concerns and others. But but also what you have to be concerned about is that you build that and and then where's the equal playing field against your competitors who are in other parts of of, of the country. Because when it comes, you're, you're selling to the same market and you're trying to, uh, you need some standards there where your, your competitors have to live by those same standards. And that's the equal playing field and that's, that's the certainty that economics and investment uh, like to have. So I don't think you can just leave this up that it's all going to work out if everybody voluntarily agrees to do something. Because what, what happens with volunteer organizations, they're usually led by an incredible personality of, uh, or team of people. And when they go, it, it, it weakens. It falls apart. There's no uh, resources to continue it. Uh, the, the energy and spirit uh, of, the, of, the, of the people that got it started aren't there. And so, uh, and, you know, just like we trying to do and so many other things is to have we know that standards work when they're when they're good standards and they're and they're sensible and frankly you've got to build in ability to uh, make some some kinds of flexible to meet with times but I think we do that and and we know how to do that and I'd be glad to try to work things out with you but don't let's not tell everybody that the standards are written in this bill because they aren't the goals are written in this bill Dr. Rosenberg, you wanted to respond? Um, thank you. Just a few quick points. First, uh, fishery ecosystem plans are not the same thing as ecosystem-based management because the whole essence is cross-sectoral. So I think there are some good things going on in fisheries, and that's great, but you've got to give people the ability to actually have an impact on other sectors. Um, secondly, I, the Commission did recommend uh, the development of pilot programs on a voluntary basis for regional ocean councils, and that has occurred. Um, to in many areas, and it has gone quite well. One of the issues there is, so what will happen in the federal waters and adjacent to those state waters? Because in many cases, um, we have had state action, as, re as indicated in the report card, um, with, with quite a good grade for the regional and state actions. But we need to make sure that for the federal water activities, we can, we can actually utilize some of the important things that are coming through from the state level. Uh, and thirdly, I would be very cautious uh, about any exemptions for any sectors. Um, a couple of years ago, I testified on a bill in the state of Massachusetts, um, and the governor, at the time Governor Romney's bill, um, was an Ocean Policy Act, um, a Comprehensive Ocean Policy Planning Act, but it exempted fisheries, coastal construction, uh, sand and gravel mining, um, <laughs> and I think port development. And at the end, it was a little hard to know what was going to be included in the Comprehensive <laughs> Oceans Act because everybody said, well, yes, you should do it to everyone else, but not to me. So everyone else should coordinate and respond to us, but not to me. And once you start down that road, I think it's just very, you lose the, the essence of the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rosenberg. I, I just want to go back quickly before we conclude here. Uh, Mr. Benton, I think you, you made a comment, uh, something on the, in the area of the Commission on Ocean Policy uh, thinks we have to look at the way we're doing things now, something on that order. And I just want to say change is hard, but sometimes needed. And I think this is the way we have to conclude this hearing that you, many of you have come up with some excellent ideas. And the author of uh, HR 21, Mr. Farr, is here. Uh, he's listened. He, I'm sure he will read all the testimonies that have come in. But uh, uh, it's something, and you all agreed, this is the future. We have to look at it. We have to consolidate it. We have to make it work more smoothly. And so uh, I just want to thank all of you for your testimonies today. And uh, to remember that uh, your full statements will be entered into the record. And I want to thank the members, although many of them, as Mr. Farr said, are on their, on their way back home now. Um, uh, you, you have the hearing record will be open for 10 days uh, if you wish to enter anything into the record. So I just want to remind you of that. And also, I ask unanimous consent that a statement from Philip Cousteau and an article on gov ocean governance be included in the record. Hearing no objection, so ordered. If there is no further business before the subcommittee,
The chairwoman again thanks the members of the subcommittee and our witnesses. The subcommittee stands adjourned. Later today here on C-SPAN 2, an all-day symposium on Congress and slavery in the District of Columbia with the scholars and history professors. That's live beginning at 8.30 a.m. Eastern.